welcome welcome back everyone to another week of our sunday services here at the kingdom church with your host your minister your prophet gary rojas i hope your week has been wonderful and excellent i hope you've joined us this past friday's prayer session today we are going to be covering uh, I'm going to be redoing an old sermon that I had to take down because the Holy Spirit told me to, and it is, was Jesus poor? And the answer is obviously no, right? So if you've already learned this or if you already watched it before, that doesn't mean that you don't have to watch it now. You still do until you internalize the word and you're able to go out and teach other people the same sermons or the same lectures or the same teaching you have yet need to study it further that's why the bible says study to show thyself approved unto god all right so for those of you who are brand new here tuning in for the very first time around the world don't be afraid that the video shows that it's an hour long trust me the hour goes by quickly and you get such revelation you get such knowledge from these videos that it might bless you so stick tuned now for those of you who are returning or if you are new and you want to subscribe be sure to hit that subscribe button and that notification bell so you can be notified every week when we do post here at the Kingdom Church and see the progress of this great ministry and where we're going to be going and where we're going. All right. So without further ado, as I always tell you, be sure to get out your notebooks, take notes. Also, leave a comment down below and hit that thumbs up button on the video. When you do leave a thumbs up and you leave a comment, that does help with the YouTube algorithm in saying that, okay, this video had this many views and this many people liked it and they even left comments and then it pushes it out to more people. And that's the best way to be able to share the gospel. It literally takes, you know, just a few seconds of your time. All right. So that's about it for those announcements. Um, be sure to also share the broadcast too. You know, if you ever come across somebody that you have yet not internalized the word and you can't teach it yourself, for example, you learn something today and you can't teach somebody else it verbally, all you have to do is just share the link, right? I send links out to new people when I evangelize them, like when I evangelize to them and I get their numbers, I send them links, right? to the book of John, to, to, to things to read, and I even send them like, you know, Bible quotes and st things of that nature. So be sure to go ahead and do that as well. Share the broadcast with your friends on your social media, whatever it is. Now, was Jesus poor? I'm going to get into the sort of, you know, what you hear people say. So that's kind of the counter argument. And then we'll go from there. So people typically say in the book of Luke, chapter 9, verse 58, this is what is written there. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And people say, oh, right there, Jesus was homeless. He didn't have a place to stay. That's incorrect. And we're going to get into that in a bit, right? So I'm just giving you the objections when people say that. right? You're, this is what you're going to hear typically people say. And that is one objection. And the other objection that you hear people say is 2 Corinthians 8, 9, right? And obviously these people, they're not they've been deceived by the enemy they've been deceived by the devil because this seed that has been implanted in christianity it says jesus was poor so then you know god wants us to be poor is just baloney right it is not true and you know for each and every single one of you that are watching me that are members of this church i'm really only focused on raising you up so that way you're able to have this information for yourself aside from everybody else in the world i'm not really concerned about them right so this is what you read in 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. So people say, oh, right there, Jesus was rich, but he became poor for us. But then the next statement says that ye through his poverty might be rich. So the Bible is saying that he became poor so that you might be rich, right? And this, this, uh, this richness is plusios in the Greeks, which actually means a material substance and wealth, not just spiritual, right? So when did Jesus became poor? The prophets pro prophesied about it, right? On the cross, he became poor on the cross. He became a curse. The Bible even says he became a curse for us. So he became a curse. Sin entered into him and he became sin. All those things took place on the cross, right? So now here are the rebuttals, the quick rebuttals for these little two objections, and then we're going to go on to the entire um, message, right? So in 1 Corinthians 4.8, 
right? Paul is speaking here to the Corinthians and he is giving a sort of, you know, abstraction between him and the apostles and the servants concerning, you know, the abstraction between them and, and people who are Christians, right? And this is what you typically see. So he says, now ye are full. So they, the Corinthian church, right? They are full. And he says, now ye are rich right there, right? Rich again. And what kind of riches are we talking about? Ye have reigned as kings without us. So they have reigned as kings without them, not actual like literal kings of the of of Corinth and Athens and Greece, right? But it, it is uh, it is it is kind of like a simile, right? That it's a comparison. He's saying you reigned as kings, meaning the way that they lived, they lived as kings, right? They they were full. They had all these things materially and spiritually and paul is saying you know i would to god ye did reign that we also might reign with you right verse 9 for i think that god hath set forth us the apostles last as it were appointed to death for we are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men right so he's saying for i think that god hath set us forth the apostles last right as it were appointed to death for we may for we are made a spectacle unto the world unto angels and men right so because christianity had just first started right these are the fathers of the faith and their efforts their labors right is the reason why we have christianity today it's all over the world it's all over the globe right so there is a difference between people of that magnitude having such great of a calling that they have sacrificed much rather than the average Christian who is living in their homes that they bought with a mortgage and has a wife and has a dog and a white picket fence and a nice job, right? That's a totally different lifestyle than the one who dedicates himself to the servitude of God and is now becoming a disciple to evangelize to the nations. Two totally different callings, right? But what people want to do, and listen very carefully, is they want to impose the lifestyles of these people, these apostles, and they, they want you to bear the burden of it. They want you to be destitute. They want you to be poor. They want you to be just like them right when the bible tunes a different tune right it plays to a different tune ah ya si antranali avrak surunias crea vax aliantra na yare cruz vrittili antrenias avrati andusas 3 john 1 2 right 3 john 1 2 it says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper. Right? I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health. So prosperity and health, even as thy soul prospereth. Right? So when he's talking about the soul, he's talking about spiritually. So the first part of him saying prospering is obviously has to be physically because in the second part of the sentence, he's already covering the spiritual. So the first part of the sentence would indicate that he is saying what? I wish above all things, not a few things, not some things, above all things, priority now, that you prosper and be in health. So he's not talking about prosperity and just health because the second part of the first sentence or right is talking about health. So that means that the first part of the first sentence must mean talking about material wealth and possessions, right? And just the certain lifestyle to not have lack and not be destitute, right? But there is a difference, and this is what I want to teach you as my fellow members and Christians, that your goal should not be to seek material wealth and possessions. No, your goal is to seek the righteousness of God and the kingdom of God first, right? That's what Matthew tells you, right? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So as a believer, it is our duty first to seek the kingdom of God, get to know God, learn to hear God's voice, how we, you know, been learning this year, right, with revelations and things like that, learning to hear his voice, learning to trust God, beginning to walk in his footsteps. And then when you begin to hear God's voice, 
clearly, you can then begin to speak with the Holy Spirit and have business talks with him and talk to him about business stuff and say, the Holy Spirit, I know your Bible says first start a business and that a man should start a business and that a wife or a woman should be supporting a man in his business. So whatever position you're in, how as a man can I start a business or, you know, these things, because you're already reading the word, you're already praying, which is good, right? Then in your intimacy, you're also now discussing with the Holy Spirit business ideas and he gives them to you. For example, I was in my paradise, right? Because remember, paradise is in the Greek, paradisios, which just means a garden. So I was in paradise yesterday. And as I was in paradise reading my spiritual father's book, The Money is Coming, which if anybody of you are out there watching, listening, I would highly recommend that you buy and read, right? But I also would highly recommend that you buy all his books and read them, right? But The Money is Coming, I was reading that outside, revelational. Right? That's what I've been telling you guys this whole year too, is the money is coming, the money is coming, right? And it is coming. It's coming in loads and varnishes and all that stuff, right? And threshing floors are, were filled, right? And as, I, as I, I was, you know, outside and I was reading the book, this thought entered into me uh, or, or a vision. This vision entered into me of a vision that I had a long time ago. This was actually the first business that I wanted to start and I wasn't able to start it because in those days I was still like thinking like a child. Even though I was doing things entrepreneurially, my mind wasn't as mature as it is today. And we're talking about like 2017, right? It's 2022 right now. So it's like four years ago. I wanted to start a hedge fund, right? And I did the business cards. I even started, you know, Rojas Investment Fund. I still have it right here, you know, the, the docs, right? But in those days, I, I, you know, I didn't really, I wasn't where I am now. And then I got the idea, again, it entered into my spirit, you know, of all these other businesses that I've been trying to start. But the best one, the one that I really love is trading stocks, tra being in the stock market. And, I, and, and this entered into me and it was a strong conviction. And I knew this came from the Holy Ghost, right? So then I began to research and, you know, for, for, for now... I'm going to be, you know, I actually just printed out because, you know, the docs just for a, a hedge fund, right? Just to do the docs, the docs for it is about 30,000. But there's a way to get it to 10,000 if you know what you're talking about, right? So through my research and all that stuff, I've just been, you know, that's what the first part of the business. So you see, even I, as I'm speaking to you right now, right? And, and I'm probably going to do more videos in the future, short videos, where I begin to counsel you guys in sorts and a lot of sort of different things. Because when I get on the phone with you, I kind of don't want to, you know, because I'm trying to minimize how I can make that interaction less sort of time constrainted, right? So I'm probably just going to make all my phone conversations, typically what I say over the phone in videos, and then just send to you the videos for you to watch them. And it's the same thing as me getting on the phone with you, because whatever I would say in the video, I would say over the phone. So, you know, this is the process of, of you know, of me when I start a business, right, of those things and how that looks. So right now is all research. So, you know, and it's setting a to-do list, right? So setting like a to-do list and a goals list and setting dates or, or you know, end times or completion dates say like, I want all this stuff done by in two weeks. So I set an end goal or end date time, right? So right now I have just printed out because the, the, the structure for a hedge fund is you need a general partnership with a limited partners, right? So it's two entities and within these entities, within these structures, you need what's called an LPA or a limited partner ship agreement and a, a private placement memorandum and between these docs is about a hundred pages of just legal stuff so what did i did what i just did is i printed out a sample right of, of hedge funds um you know that have them typically 100 pages and what i'm now going to be doing for these upcoming weeks is just spending time reading all this legal stuff getting to know all the you know the words and all the words that are being used in the sort of lingo and since I know how to read and since I know how to comprehend, right, I've printed it out. And what I'm going to do now, and I have, so this is what I did a, a while ago, right? Um, and this thing, the microphone. And why am I, why am I saying this? Because it's, Jesus was not poor, right? But, you know, since you guys are my members, um, it's good for you guys to hear some of this stuff, right? Because it's it's kind of in live. So a long time ago, you know, when I wanted to learn stocks, right? You know, I, I just got this PDF, right? 
So this was just things that I printed out, but then you can go to Staples and get it binded. So it kind of looks like a real book and then they give you the, you know, the little flaps. So since I just ended up doing that, I have the 100 page thing that I'm going to take to Staples, have them bind it, and then I'm going to read it, highlight, make all notes and learn it and internalize it just the way I've internalized the Bible. I mean, the Bible is a thousand some pages, right? This, this thing um, is about a hundred pages of legal work and legal stuff and jargon and all that stuff. And I need to know it, right? If I want to start a hedge fund, um, and I'm definitely going to start one. So that's definitely the journey and you know, all that stuff. Anyway, now let's get back to the message. But the reason why we started that was, you know, because this is on prosperity, right? And for those of you know, a hedge funds it has no cap, right? You can, like, I can see if I, if, for me, myself, me, who I know how I am myself, I can be running a multi-billion dollar hedge fund, right? Obviously not in the beginning, because in the be beginning, you need to build credibility. Maybe I can get a hedge fund to maybe 100,000 or 250,000, a quarter million, half a million, right? Um, in, in over a year's period. But again, all this stuff, right? There's a lot of stuff to it. But since I have the mental capabilities and because I have the Holy Spirit, I have God in me, I know I'm capable. I can do all these things, what? Through Christ, which gives me strength, right? So that's sort of what I want to impart to each and every single one of you is that mindset, is that ability to think that way, that, okay, yeah, you're reading your Bible, you're praying, you're doing all these things. You are doing your part in the Lord. And now, as just as John says, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper, Gary, the prophet, your prophet that's listening to here, whether I'm your father or your mentor, whatever it is, I'm now telling you, I wish above all things that you yourself would prosper as well so that you can get out of this cyclical rat race where you're constantly just working for money and then you use that money to live. So you're working to live when really you should be living life the way God intended for you to live life. Amen. Right. So what's Jesus poor? So let's start with Jesus's youth. Right, because I don't want to make this video any more longer than it should be, but let's start with Jesus' youth. Right. So what happens when Jesus was born? Well, remember he's got the Magi, right, the three wise men which come and give him gifts. So in Matthew two eleven, and when they were come into the house, they saw the young child, Matthew two eleven, with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold gifts gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So this was an actual treasure chest. So imagine receiving a treasure chest full of gold when you're born, right? When you were born, how many people came to your birth? It was probably just your mother and your father in the you know, ER or whatever, right? Nobody gave you a treasure chest full of gold. And if they did, what would your parents use it for, right? If we gave treasure chests full of gold to people in this generation, they would spend it on you know, Lamborghinis and all these things, but anybody with a wise mind and a wise sense of understanding would use that money to, you know, pay off their house or their mortgage so they can live financially free and independent, right? Because, you know, a lot of conversations that I have with people is to be financially stable and financially free. So obviously, God has already provided provision for himself, right? He've obviously provided provision way before, you know, Jesus, well, Jesus is born, right? because they obviously fled to Egypt because of the persecution. So what do you think they use the money for? Obviously for their living there, right? And you can buy a house and then obviously when they moved back to Israel, to Jerusalem, right? To Galilee, then what do you think they did? Probably sell the house, take the gold and bring it back to have a sustainable life, right? So Jesus' upbringing, you can just tell that if they were given gold, gold does not you know, lose its value right? If you purchase something with it, then you can, you know, sell it. It's the same way as money, right? If you buy a house, right? This is now financial terms for those of you who understand what equity is, right? If you have equity inside of a house, that's equity. That's money that belongs to you that you're constantly putting in. And when you sell the house, you keep the equity and you can use that equity for another house, right? So this is gold. Obviously we're staying away from the spiritual, you know, cause you can go into the spiritual stuff, but I'm sticking to the physical for this, for this illustration. So you can tell just right here that Jesus' youth, obviously, they did pretty well for themselves, right? Pretty well, especially if you have a husband who's also working, right? Then you, you can see that they're, they were living totally fine. But then now 
we obviously fast forward because you know there's a there's a break after you know jesus when he was young right and he was in jerusalem um most people are wondering what what did jesus do from when he was 12 and to 33 right well to 30. people you know there's a lot of you hear a lot of things um within the things you know within like a lot of heresy and a lot of hearsay and all these different things that say oh jesus did this or jesus was with the essenes you hear that Essene, and like all that stuff but the bible tells you exactly what jesus did he is the bible says he went home and he came and he was submit and he was under submission to his parents right and he'd submit himself to them until he was age until he was full of age and he grew in wisdom uh, and favor with all men right but when jesus starts his um ministry right in fact, actually, before we do that, before we get into Jesus's ministry, we'll get into Jesus's house, right? Because remember in Luke in chapter 9, verse 58, right? And all these verses that I give to you, remember, the best way for you is just to, to write those verses down so that way you have them. So then that way, when you go back to study throughout the week, because the proper and best way for you to do is to whatever sermon you hear be preached, is to spend the week studying what you learned so you would maybe like on one day when you're in your study you internalize you know the conversation you speak to yourself okay this is what people say like people say luke chapter 9 you know they talk about you know the foxes have holes like okay when somebody says that then what do i say and you know these different types of things so when Jesus is saying that, right, in Luke 9, 58, and Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Jesus has started his evangelical ministry, or his evangelist ministry, right? So he's evangelizing. So he's going from city to city, village to village. So he's just saying, because he spoke in parables, right? He's just saying, you know, all of you guys, you have a permanent residence that you live. But ever since I've started my physical ministry, ever since I've started my ministry, I don't have a place to lay my head. I'm always moving from one city to another. That's what he's saying. But people, because they don't have understanding, they think, oh, Jesus was homeless. And they, and they, and, and unfortunately, it's a sad thing, right? Because people read it and they think, oh, Jesus was poor. And because of modern day movies in Hollywood, they, they make it seem like Jesus lived a destitute impoverished life when in reality the scriptures this is why you should stay away from movies as well because a lot of the movies portray things that are not biblical right and when we did our we did our sermons and our videos talking about the wealth of the bible and you know the prosperity and all these different things you know the promised land so we've already covered a lot of those things so that's what that means right so for if anybody ever asks you that that's what you tell them right because that's exactly what it, what it means and it needs to make sense if it doesn't make sense for them then unfortunately there's nothing you can do you can keep trying to preach to them right so let's go to jesus's house right so jesus did have a house he had a physical house that he lived in and the bible tells you that right and where so if you're taking notes you can sort of say okay this is jesus's home or dwelling place and then you can put the verse underneath so you can sort of categorize your thoughts right so jesus did have a house in matthew 4 12 it says now when jesus had heard that john was cast into prison he departed into galilee verse 13 and leaving nazareth he came and dwelt in capernaum which is upon the seacoast in the borders of zabulon and nephthalim now this word dwelt in the greek I'll put it up on the screen so for those of you that like to write your Greek words in your Bible or whatever it is, it means, watch this, I dwell in, settle in, right? Am established in permanently. So it's a permanent establish, right? And it even says inhabit, settle down, a permanent residence, right? Permanent dwelling place as one's own right there. One's own personal residence, right? Not somebody else's, one's own personal residence. It's literally right there. It's the definition of the word right and it's a figuratively also to be exactly at home so the bible is telling you and leaving nazareth he came jesus right and went into capernaum to his house so how can a poor man if somebody is poor have a house that they own doesn't make sense right right there is one one piece of evidence and we have more than just one because we've already given you jesus's youth which is two pieces of evidence right uh, 
how are we doing? Right, how are we doing? Hopefully, this is revelation to you. Now, let's start Jesus' ministry, right? Because obviously Jesus starts his ministry, right, at, at the age of 30. So Jesus has a house, his youth was taken care of, right? When we look at Jesus' ministry, we find something very interesting in Luke 8. And now when I say we find, I'm talking about me, right? Because a lot of people miss a lot of things. And the reason why you don't hear a lot of preachers and pastors teaching on, you know, a lot of these things is because they don't know, unfortunately, right? And they don't have eyes to see. And there's another thing that I won't have enough time to get in into this video, but, you know, maybe some other time. So when we look at Luke 8, it says, chapter one, Luke chapter 8, verse 1, And it came to pass afterward that he went throughout every city and village, preaching and showing the glad tidings, glad tidings of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him. So watch that now. And it came to pass afterward that he went throughout every city and village, preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him. Now, I don't know about you, but if you bring twelve people with you from city to city, village to village, I mean, just in New Jersey, there's like over 500 townships, right? Or, or cities. Imagine going into each and every single one of them, right? You know how much money that would cost in just expenses, right? To be able to provide every day food and, and, and meals and, and, and uh, you know, a place of dwelling for 12 people. I mean, it, it gets pretty expensive, right? So you can obviously see that a poor man, if he, Jesus was poor, would not be able to sustain 12 other people, let alone himself. Right, because you look at poor people, beggars on the street, they can barely even pay and support themselves. They don't even have a permanent residence. They have nowhere to live. So this is just the scriptures, right? It, all the evidence is in the Bible. You just need to see and open up your eyes and you know, whatever, whatever has been indoctrinated into you when you, grow, when you grew up listening to stuff, you know, this is now your revelation. This is now your apocalypse. This is you growing up and, and finding the full revelation. God does not want you poor. In fact, the Bible even says that God takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servants in the book of Psalms. Right? So you see that, that Jesus is able to support not only himself, but 12 people in his journeys, in his exploits. Right? Which is an feat in himself. So how is he able to do it? Well, the Bible tells you in the next two verses. It literally says it, right? You just need to be paying attention. And certain women, which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils, verse 3, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others, which ministered unto him out of their substance, right? And many others. So there were so many people that the Bible does not make mention of them, because if they did, then there ought to be a long list of donors, a long list of partners. So when you see partnership on the on my you know website that's exactly what this is talking about jesus had many partners which ministered unto his ministry so he was able to do all these things right out of their substance so if there's anybody watching this video right now and you do have a ministry that you attend right you have a ministry that you pay your tithes to but yet you come here every weekend don't rob the lord from what you're receiving here become a partner Right, partner with thirty dollars a month, forty dollars a month, whatever the Lord puts in your heart, right? Whatever you can do, it's good to partner with the Lord, right? It's good to, to partner with his ministries and in the work of God. Nevertheless, we're gonna move on. So that was Jesus' ministry and his substance. So Jesus had donors, he had partners who were partners to his ministry that were constantly giving out of their substance in order to provide and pay for these exploits. Now even if money was not available, right? Because most of you don't even have an, a personal accountant that travels with you. Jesus had a personal accountant called Judas that traveled with him. So he was able to even have his own personal accountant. You don't have one that travels with you, right? So this is the wealth of Jesus, right? That even if there was no money, which the Bible even says that that was not the case, but even if there was no money 
in Jesus' ministry, he can just make money appear, miracle money, right? Because he's a prophet, just as I am. So the same thing, prophets have things that they do, right? There's miracles that they're known for. You look at Moses, Moses did a lot of miracles with water, right? You look at Elijah, Elijah did a lot of miracles with fire, right? And it, you know, and Jesus, obviously he did a lot of miracles with everything. So if there was no money, how can somebody who can just make money appear be poor? I mean, when you really dissect this thing, you realize how foolish these claims are that they don't come anywhere else from the devil. And yet you have Christians that believe in it, which is just sad, but there's nothing, unfortunately, we can do. So miracle money. In Matthew chapter 17, verse 24, this is what is spoken there. And when they were come to Capernaum, they that received tribute money came to Peter. So these are the tax collectors which came to Peter and said, Doth not your master pay taxes, pay tribute? Verse 25, And Peter said, Yes. And when he was come into the house, Jesus prevented him, saying, What thinkest thou, Simon? Of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? Meaning, who do the kings of the earth exact taxes from? Do they exact taxes, right, of their children or of strangers? And in verse 26, Peter saith unto him, Of strangers. And Jesus saith unto him, Then are the children free. Verse 27, Notwithstanding, lest we should offend them, go thou to the sea, Cast and hook, take up the fish that first cometh up, and when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money. Take that and give unto them for me and thee. So Jesus was able to find or make money appear out of a fish's mouth, miracle money, to pay the taxes of two people. So imagine that. Typical average taxes and anywhere from maybe like five to seven grand, right? Depending on your income. So you're looking at anywhere from ten to $14,000 of just money appearing. And if you notice, the Bible doesn't even, the Bible doesn't even say to use a, use a bait. It just says cast and hook. So it's irregular for fishes to bite on just a hook. So this, I mean, when you really look at it, right, and, and you dissect it, you realize how foolish these claims are. But yet, unfortunately, a lot of Christians believe in it, but not you not you, to each and every single person that's under the influence of my voice, you are being delivered from this moment. From this on, you are being delivered from this ignorance, from this teaching, from this preaching, from this doctrine of the world that's saying that Jesus was poor because Jesus was poor, you then now have to be poor and destitute and lacking. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. But that's, unfortunately, the world that we live in. So, we see... Jesus' ability to make money appear, miracle money, right? Now, watch this now. Remember how in Luke 8, we talked about how G, um, Jesus had many people that ministered unto him out of their substance, right? So, in this next verse, we're gonna, now going to talk about the treasurer, the accountant, which is Judas, and what Judas did, right? And this, we get this account in the book of John. So in the book of John, chapter 12, verse 3, I'm going to mention two things here. So there's two revelations within this. Uh, it's John 12, 3, and we're going to read to 8, verse 8. So there's two revelations in here. I'm just giving you revelation upon revelation upon revelation upon revelation. I mean, this is so much revelation that... This is what you receive here. We are the kingdom church, right? The kingdom revelations where miracles are commonplace. Miracles are always taking place. You know, testimonies are coming in. John, thir John 12, 3. Then took Mary a pound of... There's actually a lot of other revelations, but to the revelation that we're talking about just for money, right, that's the one we're, those are the ones we're going to cover. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Verse 4. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him. Verse 5. Why was this not sold? Why was this ointment not sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? Verse 6, this he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief 
and he had the bag and bare what was put therein. So Judas had the bag. He was the accountant and he was embezzling money for those of you who are financers, right? Who study business, who have MBAs or just bachelors of accounting, whatever it is, you understand what embezzling is. That's when the accountant steals money out of the company and he cooks the books, right? He, he fidges the numbers. So it looks like you're making money, but yet there's money missing, right? That's what Judas did because they didn't have bank accounts back then. They had money bags. And in fact, it's funny that I actually have one. Um, this is what they had. This is what they would keep, you know, little money bags. You hear that? You hear that jingling? Those are coins. Same way. So Jesus, uh, Judas had this. He had a money bag, right? And people would put their gold coins and their money and all that stuff, and he would keep it. And Judas would help himself from the bag. He would steal money from the bag to spend on himself. Now imagine, if Jesus was poor, right, and everybody else was, you know, destitute and lacking, which is not the case because they even had money, you know, to always go into the city to buy food. I mean, if you look in John 4, when he meets the Samaritan woman, it says that the disciples went into the city to buy food. But how can you buy food if you're poor? I'm just telling you. <laughs> I'm just telling you. Right? Because these homeless people, these poor men, barely have food to feed themselves for the day. Yet you see that they have enough food, enough money to go and feed 12 people that they can go into the city, buy food. And then they come back and ask Jesus, you know, did somebody give them something to eat? And then he tells them, I have, uh, I, I have meat that you know not of. Right? And that meat is to do the will of the Father. So again, we're just bringing this stuff to light. Right. Because if they were poor and destitute, right, if you had ten dollars in your bank account and we shared those ten dollars, right, that with everybody, there was 12 of us. And let's say you had ten dollars and that's because we're broken. We're all poor and we're we're living in destitute lives to preach the, the gospel. And all we have is ten bucks. I'm pretty sure that you, anybody out there would know if I took maybe a dollar out of there and at the end of the day, we go and look how much money we have and there's nine dollars. People are going to say, wait, we didn't spend any money today. How is there only nine dollars? Somebody is stealing money from the company, <laughs> right? Somebody is embezzling somewhere and they would look to the accountant, right? But that's not the case. Nobody noticed. Nobody even cared. Why? Because there was so much money coming in, as Luke 8 states, that people just kept donating money. They were giving money out of their substance. People were selling, you know, selling stuff and giving it to them. I mean, we're talking about the, the, the steward, right? Herod's steward, right? That is, a steward is a manager. So we're talking about the manager of an entire kingdom, right? So there was, they were obviously prosperous. The ministry was prosperous, period. So Jesus, God, wants every ministry prosperous, period. Because the prophecy of Zechariah talks about, right, that my, my word, right, my city shall be spread about through prosperity, right? So not only should ministries be prosperous, but in order for the ministry to be prosperous, the congregants, the members, have to be prosperous as well. And in order for them to be prosperous, there needs to be a teacher that's teaching them the secrets of prosperity that's in the Bible. That's not the prosperity of the world because the prosperity of the world is a different one. It talks about, you know, extortion and stealing and fraud and, you know, all these, you know, manipulations and these tactics and all these evil things. That is not the proper way to get wealth. The Bible even tells you the proper ways to get wealth, right? And that is what a preacher is supposed to do. A preacher is supposed to be balanced. He's supposed to preach to you the entire thing, right? And that's what you're receiving here today. And, and you know, for those of you who are my members and you've been listening, I mean, when I'm getting on phone calls, you guys are beginning to think of business ideas. You guys are beginning to, you know, think, ooh, is this an idea? And it's good that you bring them to me. It's best that you bring everything to me. If I'm your minister, you should be texting me. You should be doing that stuff. Now, obviously, I don't text back right away because there's a lot of things that I do, but I try to get back with maybe within one or two days. Sometimes I forget. So, you know, if I haven't responded, and then you should probably check up on me, right? And then I'll be like, oh, sorry, forgive me. I actually forgot right so for those of you who are the members of this church you are partaking you have you already have access to me right i've had people call me at one o'clock in the morning i had one brother who for for months would just call me all the time right and when you're ministering when, when you're ministering to people that's just sort of you know what what's what's available to you anyway so judas is the treasurer now, we're going back to John 12, but in this one, we're going to go to verse 7. We're going to continue. Then said Jesus, 
let her alone. So that means like, leave her alone. Don't say anything to her. Right? Don't say anything about her. Let her alone. Against the day of my burying hath she kept this. Verse 8. For the poor always ye have with you, but me ye have not always. So you need to watch something right there. That if Jesus was poor, he would not be calling other people poor. So Jesus just made a distinguish, uh, he just distinguished himself from the poor. For the poor always ye have with you. Right? Imagine if I'm poor and I say, yeah, you have the poor, you have other poor people, but wait, you're poor too. It doesn't work that way. He just distinguished himself from the poor. Right? He says, for the poor always ye have with you. Because the inquiry was about why didn't we sell this to give to the poor. So even Judas himself knew that we aren't poor. We're, we have sustenance. We have provision. We, we, we have plenty. Right? We have all this stuff. Right? So they are distinguishing themselves right there from the poor. But you say, people say Jesus is poor. Yet here you have a verse of two revelations. Right? Two revelations. The poor always ye have with you but me ye have not always right and now we're going to another revelation of the poor right that distinguishes jesus from the poor and this is at the santa cena how it's said in spanish or you know the um the uh lord's supper in english right assisting the poor right he's distinguishing from himself from the poor in john 13 which is the next chapter right verse 27 and after the sop satan entered into him into judas then said jesus unto him that thou doest do quickly so he whispered right he's, he's talking to him and just like nobody understands what's going on right because in verse 20 it says now no man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto him no one at the table knew so they're everybody sitting at the table talking and this was a you know he, he spoke to judas but he was speaking to satan inside of judas and he says that that thou doest do quickly right and nobody at the table knew right because everybody's talking everybody's jittering and then the master right if you're paying attention to the master the master says something and nobody at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto him verse 29 for some of them thought for some of them thought because judas was the treasure because judas had the bag that jesus had said unto him buy those things that we have need of of against the feast so you know people are thinking hmm, well maybe you know judas is going to go buy some more stuff some more food for this feast that we're having maybe he's going to go buy some you know whatever you know chicken or whatever it is that you like at your feast barbecue or arroz con pollo whatever it is you insert there that's what you would think oh maybe he's going to go buy some more stuff so that's one thing that they thought because they did it regularly. And since Judas was the treasurer, Jesus, you know, if I had my accountant or my treasurer with me and he'd be holding the credit card or whoever's in the company that has the credit card, I would say, you know, go out and buy Chick-fil-A and all this stuff. We're going to have a feast today. Right. So, so people knew, oh, OK, he's probably telling them to do that. So that's what they thought. Or the second part. Right. Buy those things that we have need of against the feast or right this is a conjunction which is a separation right it's making a distinguish a, a, it's distinguishing that he should give something to the poor so if this is what they thought i mean this is just common human behavior if this is what everybody thought that it was either that or that it's because that they were doing that or that all the time it's because in their three years of them traveling and of them journeying they knew that judas would go to buy the food and judas would be the one feeding the poor at the discretion of the master right why would they think this right if they were themselves were poor they would this would never be in their mind because first they need to find provision from themselves to feed themselves and after they feed themselves then maybe they take consideration to poor people but this is not the case it's because time and time and time and again i'm revealing to you that jesus's ministry was prosperous jesus himself was prosperous and so was each and every single one of the apostles right the disciples they never lacked never lacked anything and now since we are talking about that about lack right this is a great segue into the next clip or into the next verse because we're talking about lack that they never lacked nothing and this is now proof all i'm giving to you is proof upon proof upon proof upon proof this is back to back to back to back to back evidence right 
And if you want to share this with other people, I would highly recommend that you share this video. If people say that Jesus was poor and say, if you can't deliver this sermon the way I deliver it, which is okay, right? But that's why you have and take notes. That's the reason why you take notes is sit there that you practice with your own Bible and you walk back and forth like this and then you try to give the sermon yourself. Because with your own notes, you can print it out, right? And you can put the, the notes there and then you look down to your own notes and give the own sermon. That's how you're supposed to practice, right? Because if I'm giving to you the notes, right? Right, if I'm giving to you the notes or the verses, then you, as you write just the verses down, then you can go off and take that notebook and then when you're in Bible studies with other people, you can then give that sermon. You can say, I have a sermon to give about Jesus being poor. Would you guys like to hear it? And say, oh yeah, you know, I think we, Jesus was poor. And then that's how you can begin to save other people from their ignorance. You can deliver them, right? That's, that's ministry. That's the whole vision, right? Is that I feed into you, I give you the revelations, you don't even have to credit me. You don't even have to say, oh, I learned this from this, nothing. Go off and run with it yourself because I give it to you freely, right? As the Bible says, freely you receive, freely give. Jesus lacked nothing. Neither did the disciples, neither did any of them. And this is it right now. So in Luke chapter 10, this is the uh, dispatch. Jesus dispatches evangelists. After these things, Luke 10 verse one, after these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also. Right, so he appointed 70 others also and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. So for those of you who are thinking that you want to evangelize, try to find a buddy. Go two and two because it's better to do it in twos because it, you know you, you build up your own confidence that way that you're not alone. You know, you got somebody there with you that's also encouraging you and you guys are working together. So two and two. But watch this now. Verse two. Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye before the Lord of harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Verse 3, Go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Verse 4, Carry neither purse, nor script, nor shoes, and salute no man by the way. So he's saying, carry no, no, no purse. So for you, for women, and no purses. You'd probably be like, this is insane. But it really means the money back. The purse means the money back, right? That's the purse that has money. So Jesus is telling you, when you go, don't even take any money. Don't take any gold, right? And that's obviously also in Matthew, we get the same rendition, rendering, right? Carry neither purse nor script nor shoes and salute no man by the way. Verse five, and into whatever city, whatever house you enter, first say, peace be to Hess. And he just goes on and he's listing all these different things. That's in chapter 10. Okay, so you know just how cha how stories play out that happened early, right? Because things that happened. So he so he sent the, he sent the seventy out. So because it's a story and we're we're being told this stuff, right? This is why it's also good to take notes and and put things in remembrance because then you begin to say, oh, that leads to that and that leads to that. Obviously, a lot of things take place from Luke ten to Luke twenty two, but in Luke twenty two, this is now the conversation that is had in Luke chapter twenty two. Verse 35, this is what is said. And he said unto them, unto who? To the, to the people that he sent out. When I sent you without purse and script and shoes, lacked ye anything? Right, because in, in chapter 10, he just sent them out and he told them no script, no shoes, no nothing. So now in 22, they came back, right? And he says, when I sent you without purse and script and shoes, lacked ye anything? Kayavas kalavraniyat. Vedekasuruvunu bayarenesiyat. What is said there? And they said, nothing nothing when i sent you without any money when i sent you without any food nothing did you lack anything and they said nothing so right there there's obviously a revelation that none of them lacked so if you or ever hear somebody say something like the, the disciples and the people were poor and they were lacking and destitute that's how you know that these are the devil's lies because that's contrary to the bible it's contradictory and unless you are equipped, because that's what this is. This is the equipping, right? Equipping of the saints. When I give you these revelations, it's to equip you. So that way you are a mighty warrior, a mighty daughter of God, a mighty man of God, fully equipped. So that you're at, and, and the Bible says, right? Right? Sh study to show thyself approved and ready and willing to give an answer for your faith. So every time you need to be willing and ready to give an answer to somebody. So when so somebody says Jesus is poor and Jesus was lacking, and all these people was lacking, you can say that's actually contrary to the Bible. And here are the reasons why so, so, and so. And in fact, I can give you a link to my teacher, right? To the ministry that I attend. He did a great sermon on it. I recommend you watch it. You've done your job. 
if they don't go and, and listen to your words or watch the video, nothing you can do there. You can't force people. But you've done your job as an evangelist and you've done your job in spreading the gospel. It's really that simple. It's really so easy as that, right? Any video, like if you're trying to explain the promised land to people and they don't understand it, you don't need to explain it to them because you have yet, in, you have yet to internalize it yourself. So you have yet to go and study that right so that's why there's videos like this where you say you know what i'm going to send you a link to a video watch it in this you know watch it in this order you send three links watch it in this order you get the revelation of the wilderness and and then you know um you get the revelation of the wilderness and the promised land all these different things and then if they don't watch it if they don't listen there's nothing you can do you've tried that's it that's evangelism right so they lack nothing so upon one two three four five six seven eight so we already have eight pieces of evidence i mean if you just have one verse if the bible even mentions one verse indicating something like that then it should be sound enough but i've given you eight pieces of evidence of jesus wasn't poor so with these eight pieces of evidence you can go out and take them and and teach it to other people and yet if they still remain ignorant to the fact there's nothing you can do because you've just given them eight and we're still not finished we're almost finished though, but we're not. Watch this now. Are you ready for this? Because I'm gonna I'm gonna go to now. Jesus even had Jesus even rode in a in a Bentley. Jesus rode in a Ferrari. Jesus had whatever BMW, Mercedes S Class, right? Lamborghini Aventador of their day. Jesus rode it. So watch this now right don't believe me watch this now mark 11 and when they came nigh to jerusalem unto bethage and bethany at the mount of olives he sending forth two of his disciples verse 2 and saith unto them go your way into the village over against you and as soon as ye be entered into it ye shall find a colt tied wherein no man sat loose him and bring him and what happened he brought him and jesus sat on the colt and everybody was throwing you know putting uh, leaves sheaves before him and singing hosanna in the highest right if you notice if you read that scripture carefully right go your way into the village over against you as soon as you be entered into it you shall find a colt tied wherein never man sat so that means no one ever sat on this colt nobody ever put their behind on that car and a colt that in those days that was like the lamborghini the mercedes of today right to be able to have something like that right would mean that you were oh there's a rich guy look at him look at, look at him driving in his lamborghini look at him driving in his in his mercedes s class right and that's you getting a car because some cars they'll have like 50 miles or 100 miles meaning people have driven it already that means p another man's butt or several man's butts were sat in that chair of the car that you're buying yet in this car the car that jesus drove through the city no one has ever sat on there <laughs> uh. I'm just telling you. This is in your Bible. Right? It's in your Bible. But the thing is, most people, even after having been told the truth, I don't know. I mean, you just really have to pray for them. And, you know, I'll, I'll teach uh, and I'll probably do another video on prayer, but it's not a sermon, a video of like an instructional video. And we're already at 53 minutes. But right there, nobody's ever sat. So if you ever need a verse for a car, or you're praying for a car, use this verse. I'm telling you, use this verse and confess it. Keep confessing it. Jesus, you drove, even you had a car, Jesus, when you went into the city, right? I need a car to get to work. I need a car to do all these things. And the Lord will provide. He will provide because the Lord is more concerned with you knowing the word because that's what seeking the righteousness in the kingdom of God is because you're filling yourself. You're taking the time out to fill yourself with revelation. You're taking the time out to sit, you know, for an hour every week to learn, to increase. You are investing in yourself. 
you deserve a reward. You're investing in your revelation. Don't let anybody lie to you. Don't let anybody fool you saying that you're not growing, saying that you're not studying, saying that you're not doing any of this stuff. When you come every week on here to listen to me preach, to give you the revelations, you are increasing, you are learning. Right? So you just need to confess it. Confess the word. Right? If you need a car, if you need a job, whatever it is, confess the word. Find the words. Find verses in the Bible. I've given you many, right? In the book of Daniel, when uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were better, were ten times better than all the astrologers and sorcerers and magicians in the land, right? That's work. That's employment. They were better than all of them right so there's a verse right there for an employment when you're when you're seeking uh to look for a job you can confess i'm a son of god i'm 10 times better than anybody who's going into that interview and you just keep confessing i declare and decree by the authority of the spirit that this job lord is mine i take it it is mine i claim it i'm going to be 10 times better than any single person who is applying right and then you go in there with such certainty with such power that yeah you are now 10 times better than, than anybody who's applied for the position right and i've obviously used that and i've told you about the testimony when i've used that i got the i got the job on the spot they hired me on the spot they said yeah the job is yours if you want it right so this stuff this revelation that if you don't catch it you're going to be left behind so here's a revelation a verse that you can use for a car and i just gave you another one for for um, a job, right? Aside from the whole revelation which I've given you, right? So you're receiving, you're receiving a lot here, right? And you always do, right? So for those of you who haven't yet partnered or you haven't given anything, be sure to partner. Be sure to go ahead and do that at the website at GaryRojas.com, right? Don't rob the Lord. That's definitely something that you don't want to do. Anyway, we're going to go to the last uh, piece of evidence. So that's nine, nine pieces of evidence. And I'm going to give you the 10th one, the last one right so you can learn these pieces of evidence because there's 10 so you can maybe like learn two or three and then internalize those two or three and then learn the next two or three and then internalize those two and three until you get to 10 where then you can just begin to give that sermon to people that you can just sit you'll go into somebody's house you'll sit in the chair and then say jesus was poor you know god wants us to be poor and you go ah uh, and then you just open up your bible and then you give the teaching and if there's pushback, if there's fighting, then obviously that works your patience because now they're trying your patience. And then you just say, okay, that's fine. And then you leave that place and you never go back, right? Because you obviously know that if you hang around these people, your revelation, your light is going to get dimmed because the Bible says the entrance of thy word giveth light. So if you stick around with them too long, then that light that is in you is going to get dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. And it's going to, you know, be just like theirs because they're going to dim your light. So... Tenth piece of evidence, Jesus' clothing, right? And for this one, we go to his crucifixion. John 19, verse 23. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts, to every soldier a part, and also a coat, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. Watch this now. First of all, who would part your garments? Who would even part your garments to sell them? So that means the garments were expensive, right? That enough for soldiers in an army who receive wages to part them for what? For them to wear? No, for them to sell and make money. So even him, Jesus is wearing in those days, the Gucci, the Prada, the Versace. He's wearing this, right? Look at this jacket. A jacket like this is a jacket. In those days, only merchants, only rich people would wear. Poor people couldn't afford a jacket like this. A coat like this this coat was without seam woven from the top throughout the bottom this is an expensive coat but how can a poor man have a kind of coat like this because he wasn't poor right and look what the soldiers say in verse 24 they said therefore among themselves let us not rend it let, let's not tear it but cast lots for it whose it shall be that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, they parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. Right? Because they, you, if you would part that, that, that jacket, that coat, you'd obviously ruin it, and it, it wouldn't be worth it, what it was worth. So you have right there 10 pieces of evidence that Jesus was not poor. And that's today's revelation. Right? Um, it's it was delivered a little bit differently than the one I did before I actually uh, put some more stuff in here right uh, like the car um, and the uh, the rebuttals the objections 
right? And then the lacking part. And there's still more to this message. There's still more to it if you believe it or not, right? But unfortunately, um, we'd be here, you know, for probably like another half hour or so. And I kind of just want to make this online stuff, you know, just an hour um, because the Holy Spirit's already said what he needed to say, right? And then, you know, if there, you know, when we get to the physical location and physical ministry, when that time comes, then obviously we can go on, we can, you know, um, do longer, longer content because it, it's then dependent upon the people in the studio, right? Uh, interacting and all that stuff. Anyway, that's it for today's message. Was Jesus poor, right? So I'm now going to call for the tithes and the offerings and the partnerships, right? So if there's anybody watching right now, watching for the first time, or you've been watching for some time now, and the Lord's probably put it in your heart, don't be afraid to become a partner, right? But also don't become a partner only to cancel your partnership you know, in a in a month or so, because that, that happens, right? They get a, they people do a partnership for one month. They see it comes out the next month, and they immediately cancel, right? You don't want to be back and forth that way, because that's an undisciplined Christian, right? Because typically, what that says is that this person beats against the waves. The waves beat them, right? They they are floppy goosey, right? They're flip flop, and if they're flip flop in that, you can just imagine that this is the type of Christian that's probably been in circles, going on in circles for a pretty long time. They've been in hills and valleys. They've never had this forward progression. Why? Because they still have a lot, a lot of things to learn. Because the problem isn't the branch, right? Because when we give the tree example, the problem is not the branch; it's the root, right? It, it, it is what is their foundation that's the issue. That's the problem. So we first got to fix that, and then you know the the tree would be sort of good, right? But anyway, that's about it. For those of you who want to uh, go ahead and partner down below at GaryRojas.com, you can give a partnership, you know, monthly, whatever the Lord puts in your heart, right? If you have been attending, if you have been watching and you, you haven't yet decided to take that step, maybe now is the time. But for those of you who give, who are members, you know, be sure to give your tithe if you haven't already given your tithe and, you know, uh, give an offering, whatever the Lord is putting into your heart as well. Now, aside from that, I'm now going to pray as I've been doing. Uh, something that the Holy Spirit wants me to begin implementing because obviously I believe in Lord Jesus Christ and I believe in his miraculous power to heal. So something out of these sermons is always at the end, praying for your healing. Now, what do I mean by that? If I've already prayed for your healing, then it's not every sermon, um, this is what I teach you, that you're re-praying for it because then you're just giving thanks. So like if, and there's people that I've already prayed for. So it's, you know, the first time, receive your healing and then every time when we do this stuff it's just thanks and then i'm going to pray for the offering and the giving and then we'll close all right so take your right hand wherever it is that you are for those of you who are sick maybe the first time you watch a sermon somebody sends it to you a friend whatever whatever it is maybe you're blind maybe you wear glasses whatever your sickness whatever it is here's your chance to catch your healing to receive your miracle because your miracle isn't tomorrow god is not a god of miracles of tomorrow his miracles are now Right. He's in the now. He doesn't. God is not a God that goes to sleep for him to have a tomorrow and for him to have a yesterday. He's always in a now. Right. So take your right hand and place it on whatever place you, you have your infection or your disease or wherever it is that you need healing, pain, whatever it is. Father, I just want to thank you, sir, for this day. And I pray for anybody under the influence of my voice that is listening to me now whether they have any pain or infection or disease in their body, we cancel that today. Let them receive their miracle. Whether it be headaches or migraines, that they have issues of chronic headaches, we cancel that in the name of Jesus. Let those headaches, let those migraines be gone now in the name of Jesus. If anybody is under the influence of my voice that has any muscle strains anywhere in the body, muscle strains, whether it be in the neck, or in the calves, anywhere. We release those strains now in the name of Jesus. We pray for those muscles, even joint pains, any pains in your joints. You have maybe arthritis in the fingers, right? Or wrists or elbows and shoulder joints. Pains, chronic pains, maybe in your hips, maybe in your knees. We cancel all those joint pains in the name of Jesus. Pain must be gone now. I speak to that pain that is in your body. I speak to that pain. You must leave now. You must leave that vessel now in the name of Jesus. 
any one that is under the influence of my voice. You must be gone now in the name of Jesus. Any sort of issues or contaminations of the blood, whatever it is, we restore your blood cells. We increase your red blood cells. Whatever it is, if there's a defi deficiency in iron, we increase, we replenish, and we restore via Raksalavrania Deveakus. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah. Receive your miracle now. Receive your healing now. If there is anyone that's under the influence of my voice that has a hearing issue, perhaps you can't hear, stick your finger in that ear. If it's one, then do both, whatever it is. I command that ear to be open. Ifata in the name of Jesus. Let sounds begin to enter. Let hearing come into you now in the name of Jesus. If anybody under the influence of my voice has vision loss, you are wearing glasses, take those glasses off and put your fingers on your eyelids like this. I speak to those eyeballs. I speak life into those eyeballs. I speak restoration into the retinas, into the vision. And I cast out any vision loss in the name of Jesus. Vision is coming to you now. Vision is being restored to you now in the name of Jesus. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it wherever it is that you are. Check. Begin to check. Begin to check your eyesight. Any sense of nasal, sense of smell being lost or taste buds being lost, I restore your sense of smell and I restore your sense of taste in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Any spinal cord injuries, we restore those spine. We bring that spinal cord back to alignment in the name of Jesus. It is being aligned as we speak. Any spirit of paralysis, paralysis in your arms, or in your body, in your legs that is preventing you from walking. I speak life into those legs. I speak life into those arms. Begin to walk, begin to stand up. Grab your nurse, grab your maid, grab your parents, whoever it is, and stand up out of that wheelchair right now in the name of Jesus. One, two, three, stand up right now in the name of Jesus and begin to walk. Begin to walk, receive your miracle. It is coming to you now. For any of you that are on a walking stick, a walking cane, or crutches, do the same. Begin to walk. Throw those crutches to the side and begin to walk. Receive your miracle. Receive your healing in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Receive your miracle. Receive your healing. Father, I just want to thank you, Lord, for each and every single one of them. For you are mighty, and I believe in instantaneous miracles and healings. Thank you, Lord, for healing them. And now I pray for their giving. I pray for their tithe offering, that, you, that it may be blessed, and that you continue to pour out for them from the windows of heaven, that they may continue to receive that blessing, that they may be able to continue to give tithing. For out of that window do you prosper them to give their tithes. Bless it, sanctify it, multiply it, and increase it. I pray for their offering. Let their offering be sanctified and holy before thee. And let their partnerships and their seeds also be sanctified. In Jesus' mighty name, Lord, I pray for this message over their life, that it may be a seed in them to reach to them, to give to them the apocalypsis in order to be able to walk in the full revelation, being fully equipped of your word. And that any seed that was planted in them by the enemy, we uproot it now in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen and amen. All right. So that's going to be it for this week's Sunday service. I hope to see each and every single one of you guys next Friday for our Friday prayer sessions. And be sure to, you know, invite people, invite people to, to prayer. You know, maybe you find somebody that enjoys prayer sessions, invite them. Maybe they might enjoy it as well. Or invite somebody to your house and you can start having, you know, prayer sessions at your house, whatever it is you can be sure to go ahead and do that. All right, so I'll see you guys this Friday. God bless.